Hi, my name is Mark Boxall. I'm a principal engineer at FactSet. <clears throat> and today I'm going to talk to you about how we use DGraph and DQL to build a point in time model of financial objects. So the universe of financial objects, it includes things like countries, companies, securities, stock exchanges, indexes, funds, commodities, and a lot more. These objects are related in many different ways, and many of these relationships can change over time. So with the universe loaded into DGraph, our clients can now easily explore these objects and their relationships as they exist today or at any time in the past. So in this talk, I'll give a quick tour of the actual data model. I'll talk about why we wanted to use a graph database and why we specifically chose dgraph. Uh, I'll give some details of our dgraph cluster, and then we'll run through some query examples. So first let's dive into the data model and start nice and simple. Um, we have just two nodes here, a company and a country, and they're connected with an edge called is domiciled in. And domiciled is really just the home uh, country for a company. So we can see here that Marine Max is essentially just a US-based company. Uh, in this next slide, we're looking at a second company, Boatyard Inc., uh, which is controlled by Marine Max. And that just means that Marine Max has 50% you know, or more ownership of Boatyard Inc. and therefore controls it. Um, you know, another way of Expressing that is it's just a subsidiary. So Bodyard Inc. is a subsidiary of Marine Max Inc. Uh, and now explain, uh, expanding you know, out to all of the first level subsidiaries. I don't expect you to read all that. It's just to kind of show the shape of the data. Uh, it looks as follows. And then including all the subsidiaries, all levels, uh, it looks like that. And the deepest subsidiary is you know, three levels deep here. And you know some other examples could go as deep as 20, uh, as 20 levels of subsidiary. Uh, and in this slide, I'm including the securities now, and let's zoom in on some of those. Uh, so we can see Marine Max has some bank loans, some revolving lines of credit. It also has a fixed term loan, uh, and it has a common stock. So zooming in on that common stock, we can see it's connected back to the company with is issuer of edge. So we say that the company is the issuer of the common. Um, and you know, typically, and in many cases, uh, a common stock may have all kinds of other derivative securities that are based off of it. And you know, the terminology we use is underlier. So we say that the equity is the underlier of the derivatives. Uh, in this case, we have an options contract, uh, which has a strike price of $45 and expired on March 13th. Oops, March 19th. Uh, and zooming out, we can see the full picture. We have the common stock over here with all of the different options contracts that are derived from it. Uh, Marine Max in the middle here with all of the subsidiaries extending off to the left. So let's look at some of the other nodes, interesting nodes in the data model. We have things like the companies, the governments, various different kinds of securities like uh, P notes, money market uh, securities, mutual fund share classes, ETF shares, etc. cetera. Uh, but there are also some you know, perhaps less expected nodes like cheese and coffee. And these are included in the data model because they, these are the commodities uh, that underlie all kinds of futures contracts. Uh, looking at the edges, we've already talked about is controlled by, uh, is issuer of, and is underlier of. Uh, a couple of other notables are you know, tracks, so if you have a mutual fund or an ETF that's tracking a particular index, uh, we link them up with the tracks edge. Uh, and is advisor of, if we have a you know, asset management company that's uh, advising on a mutual fund, those 
the you know the company, the advisor company, and the mutual fund will be linked up with an is advisor of edge. And now onto the properties or the value edges in dgraph. Uh, a lot of these are just symbols and identifiers that are used to identify securities, but also to identify companies. Uh, so something like QSIP, CDOL, ISIN, ticker. These are all very common security level identifiers. Uh, and something like legal entity identifier is a company level identifier. So typically our clients have access to these symbols and they'll, they'll use these as a starting point to you know, locate an object in the graph before starting any traversal. Uh, is public is a flag that we uh, put on the company nodes and it basically just separates the private companies from the public companies. And this is a point in time property. So, you know, a company would start out private and then possibly a few years later, it might go public. And then potentially, even, you know, in some cases, it could even revert back to being private uh, several years after that. So why did we want to use a graph database? Hopefully it's becoming uh, clear based on the shape of the data that you know, this user universe of financial objects really does naturally form a graph structure. And in fact, there are you know, many more relationships between the nodes uh, that I wasn't showing that make it even more graph-like. So that was you know, one reason it was a natural fit to the data. Uh, but also, you know, ease of querying. And we realized graph databases come with these purpose-built query languages that are really designed for querying you know, heavily connected data in a, in a very concise way. And, you know, the queries that you use are, you know, a lot, a lot more concise, a lot cleaner than something like SQL, where you're, you know, the meaning of the, the query, what you're trying to achieve with the query that very quickly gets lost in all of the joins. And then the final point, uh, the final compelling thing about graph databases is we, we felt that you know, with a graph database and with a you know, well-designed data model, it should actually be feasible to open up the backend database to all of our internal users and application developers uh, and you know, allow them to explore the data on their own and write their own query. So we're really talking about like full self-service um, to the backend database. Um, and this you know, really wouldn't have been possible with our old relational setup. Um, you know, there's just too many, um, you know, it would require too much special knowledge um, of, this, of the table schema, and there would just be too much scope for problems and bad assumptions. So this wasn't something we were comfortable of doing on, on the old setup. And, you know, the self-service model will really eventually allow us to retire hundreds of endpoints that we have today that literally exist just to bridge the gap between the applications and the backend database. So that was why we were interested in, in graph databases in general. And what, you know, here are the reasons why we ultimately went with, with dgraph. Open source, um, you know, of course that was a big one. And it's been really nice to be able to create issues directly on the dgraph GitHub. Uh, it's also been really convenient to be able to pull and locally build uh, unreleased code if we wanted to you know, check out new and upcoming enhancements uh, and try out bug fixes. And also, you know, we like the fact that it's you know, less of a black box. And if you want to figure out how something's working internally, we can go look at the code, crack it open, try to understand what, what's going on. Uh, especially if we're trying to optimize for performance, it can be really uh, valuable to be able to have that um, visibility into the code. Uh, we definitely like the scalable distributed architecture. And of all the graph languages out there, we really felt DQL was one of the more intuitive and something that we felt comfortable putting in front of our application developers um, with you know, a good degree of confidence that they'd be able to start writing queries without a huge learning curve. Uh, and one of the, you know, the features, unique features of dgraph that we really liked was the facets feature, because we realized that we could use that to implement a, a true point in time graph. And that was something that we always wanted to do from the outset. Uh, you know, we realized that these financial objects aren't static, they're continually evolving. 
companies keep merging, um, spinning off, acquiring other companies, and every day new securities get issued, other securities mature or expire. So things are constantly changing, and we wanted to reflect that in, in the data model. Uh, even something like countries um, are not static. So I looked it up yesterday. There, Since 1990, there were 34 new countries that came into existence. So nothing is really static. And you know, so a little bit more on the facets. So DGraph facets are just attributes that you can associate with an edge. So what we did was for every edge in the database, we associated a start time and end time facet, which defined the interval over which the edge existed. And then at query time, we can filter on those facets so that clients can, have, can look at the graph exactly as it was as of a particular point in time, either today or any time in the past. Uh, we liked the overall reliability of the product. Uh, during testing, we didn't see any unexpected or unexplained crashes. Um, and you know, it did pretty well under high load. So that was that was a big plus factor. And it gave us great performance for our use case. And we definitely liked the flexible schema. We realized that our data model was going to continue to evolve. We're going to want to add new node types, new edge types. Uh, and you know, with DGraph, that's certainly possible with minimal disruption. Uh, we definitely wanted to be able to host on the cloud, and that's certainly possible. And the cost was definitely quite favorable for an enterprise license, so that was a big factor for us. And last but not least, the community. So right from the very start, the DGraph engineers had been really responsive to our questions uh, and very quick to release bugs bug fixes and any enhancements that we had requested. So you know, you know, we decided to go with DGraph and finish the data model and started loading data and landed up with 160 million nodes, 2 billion edges, and that includes the value edges and the, you know, the real relationships as well in that number. And we're currently hosting on three sort of medium-sized EC2s eight vCPUs, 61 gigs of memory, and uh, 1.8 terabytes of storage. And we're running one alpha and one zero per EC2. And currently we don't use any sharding. The, you know, even though that seems like a large number of nodes and edges, we were able to comfortably fit that on one EC2. So there's been no need for sharding yet, but it's certainly Nice to know that that is a, a possibility in the future if our data set got significantly larger. Uh, so yeah, the next sequence of slides, we're going to look at some actual queries. And um, before I dive in, I just want to mention that the query language that we expose on our API, it's really just DQL, but with a couple of additional functions, helper functions and directives that we've added just to make querying a little bit easier, especially when it comes to point in time querying. So let's start with this first query. The, the first query block is a var, which just means that it's not gonna return any data. And we're matching on the name, Alphabet Inc., the name of a company. And we want to recursively follow the is controlled by edge in the reverse direction. The tilde just denote, denotes a reverse edge. Uh, and we want to find all the subsidiaries and the subs of subs um, basically expand the entire corporate tree of Alphabet Inc. So we you know we store all of these companies in the sub variable. And then in the next query block, we pull out the UIDs from that variable and count them to get a, a total count of subsidiaries. Uh, and then we're just going to list out the names of the first three subsidiaries. So that comes back as follows. We have 219 total subsidiaries, and here are some examples. And let's say we wanted to extend this a little bit, and you know, not only do we want to pull in the subsidiaries, but we want to see what securities are issued at any level in that subsidiary tree. Uh, and to do that, we pull in the is issuer of um, edge, and the, the nodes on the other side of that edge will be your securities. So we pull it, pulling in, going one step further in the, in the recursive traversal. 
Uh, so those securities are stored in this variable and same thing again, convert to UID, count them, and then pull out in this case, the long name uh, and print out the first three. So in total across all the subsidiaries, we're picking up 34 securities. And these first few are a class A and a class B common stock and something known as a depository receipt. For, for this query, we're gonna build it once again on the previous query. And, but not only do we wanna pull in the immediate securities that are issued, but as we also wanna pull in derivatives that are uh, that the immediate securities are the underlier of. So we add one more edge type here is underlier of, and we're gonna be storing the initial set of securities in S and the additional derivative securities in D. And then down here, we're gonna be grabbing the UIDs for both the regular securities and the derivatives, and then grouping on type and getting a type account for each type. And we find that there are a total of eight common stock, uh, 11 bonds, 12 bank loans, and over 10,000 derivatives. And finally, for this, in the sequence of slides, we're gonna look at you know, which stock exchanges do any of these securities trade on? So we've found all the securities, we found all the derivatives. Now we wanna see you know, across the globe, which exchanges uh, do they trade on? So to do that, we follow actually four more edges. Lists in is part of in reverse, trades in and has source. And the nodes on the other end of has source are the actual stock exchanges. And same thing again, we're gonna count them and print out a few examples. And we've picked up 78 uh, unique exchanges that Alphabet trades on. And here are some examples. Point in time, ultimate parent. So before looking at the query here, I just wanna kind of explain what that concept means. Uh, and Quite commonly, a company might issue a bond and that bond might mature many years in the future. And before the company's had a chance to pay off all the debt, it may get acquired. So at the time that it gets acquired, the remaining debt becomes the responsibility of the acquiring or parent company. Uh, but that parent company could in turn be acquired as well, and at which point the responsibility for the debt shifts once more. So really, you know, at, you know, at any point in time over the full lifetime of the bond, there could be any number of different ultimate parents that are responsible for the, for the debt. And that's, that's a question that our clients like to ask and something that we can solve with this, this point in time model. So looking at an actual example, uh, we have Interline Brands Inc that issued a bond back in 2010 that matured eight years later in 2018. Uh, but before it was able to pay back all of that debt, Interline Brands was acquired by Home Depot, who then essentially took over responsibility for that debt until the bond matured in 2018. So looking at the query, uh, the first thing you'll notice is that the point in time is separate from the actual DQL query. Uh, these are provided under separate keys on, on our API. And what the user is really telling us here is they want to run this piece of DQL and they want to get the results as, as of this date, as of this point in time. So looking in a little bit more detail in the query, we're going to, at this time, going to come in with the QCIP. And the QCIP is a very common identifier for identifying bonds. Uh, so we're going to match on QCIP and then we want to recursively follow a couple of edges. We're going to go is issuer of to find the immediate issuer of the bond, which will be interline brands. But then we want to follow is controlled by to see if there are any companies that are controlling that issuer and all the way up recursively to the top of the control tree. And as of this date, we don't find any controlling companies. So, you know, this is a date before the acquisition occurred. So interline brands was still its own freestanding company and it was essentially its own ultimate parent. But if we go forward one day to the day of the acquisition, we're now picking up one level of is controlled by, and we can see Home Depot now becomes the 
ultimate parent as of that date. So I've mentioned before, you know, that we use facets for this point in time filtering, but let's look at how that is actually achieved. Here once again is the user query, and that gets rewritten as follows before we send it off to dgraph. And it's really pretty much the same query, except now that every single edge is, uh, includes this facets, facets clause. And really what that's doing is it's limiting those edges to, the, to those edges that are active on this date. So any of the other edges that exist that are inactive will just be filtered out. And this final example, we're going to look at another point in time query with a slight spin. Um, and what we, what we want to do here is do, you know, query the graph as of this date, but for a particular field, in this case, name, we want to see the full history over all of time. Uh, and in this example, we're going to match on a CIK, which is a US government issued identifier for companies. And then we want to pull the full name history, see all the names of that company over all of time. But then for legal entity identifier, we want to just get the current, currently active LEI as of this date. And you'll see here, we've introduced this new tag called add history. This is not part of DQL, but something that we added in and support in our query rewriting layer. So what that gives you is um, three different names over time. So this company had three names over its lifetime and the most recent name change occurred on 5th of March. So we get all the names along with their start and end time information. But for this other field, which did not have the add history tag, uh, we're just getting the LEI that existed as of the, the 11th of March. And how is this done in terms of facet filtering? Well, here once again is the user query and that gets rewritten as follows. And you'll notice for name, because it has the add history tag, we no longer do that filtering on the facet. And instead we just will return all names along with their start times and end times. Whereas for the LEI, we're gonna do the regular facet filtering and just get LEIs that are active on the 11th of March. Uh, and that's all that I had. Thanks for listening, and I look forward to taking your questions in the Q&A.